Hello again everyone. I'm here today with another Jackson's Haul. This whole order was in response to an email about early Black Friday. Uh, it may be after that by the time I end up posting this, but the uh, special edition Schminka palette that they had this year. They actually have a have a few or had a few depending on <laughs> depending on uh, what they have available at this time. But this was a new one that I had never seen as far as the case is concerned. It's sort of a slim case. They call it the slim line edition. So I'm going to get into that. I'm I'm going to be swatching these colors today. Uh, but I am not going to be swatching these colors on this watercolor paper, which I will tell you about. Uh, so this is Jackson's brand watercolor paper. I got a couple of different sizes. I got the 5x7, which I opened so that you can see the texture of the paper. I'm going to open that up for you and show you. And then I also got the 8x10, which I left in its uh, wrap here. So the reason why I'm not going to be swatching on this today, uh, I plan on, on doing a follow-up. There, there's actually a lot of different watercolor papers that I plan to profile on the channel and compare. I, I just have a stack of them that I just need to get to and do some actual painting on them and uh, comparing them. But the reason why I'm not going to be doing that today is because there is only 15 sheets in both of these because they're pretty uh, substantial paper. They're 300 GSM. And uh, I got the cold press, but they also have hot press if that's your thing. They were really inexpensive, but I do want to save the 15 sheets that I have for actual paintings. So I will at some point, you know, it might be a while because life gets in the way sometimes, but I will at some point do a follow up with probably not just this paper, but a lot of other papers with actual watercolor paintings on them to kind of give you my thoughts on the comparison of the papers. Because now I have quite a few, especially sketchbooks with 100% cotton paper. Um, that would be good to compare. So, uh, but I did want you to know about this new Jackson's brand paper. And like I said, it is pretty inexpensive. I think this one, this little five by seven was only like $3 or something like that. And then it was a little bit more for the eight by 10, but still, even, even if though it just has 15 sheets, it's still a pretty good deal for, um, cold press, really nice quality watercolor paper. So I'm going to show, oh, and it does say on the back, that's what I was just looking at. It says 100% vegan product. So I know that there aren't necessarily a lot of watercolor papers that are available that are vegan. And I think the reason for that is the sizing that they put on the paper. Because obviously if it's cellulose or if it's cotton, that's usually the two main materials that watercolor paper are made out of. Neither one of those is an animal product, but uh, sizing usually uh, includes some kind of glue and the glue itself could contain animal products. But this does not because it is labeled as 100% vegan. I think that um, Jackson's is really doing a great job of trying to make sure that a lot of their products are vegan. Uh, Schminka is not, I'm gonna tell you that. <laughs> uh, I think that Rembrandt is, who I'm gonna uh, show you these tubes and the some uh, swatches from them as well. But I'm gonna put these aside so that we can get to the other items. Um, and let me go ahead and get in here with the texture of the paper. That's what I was trying to do. So I think that you will be able to see, because different, even within, there you go, that's, that's a pretty good image there. Even with different cold press watercolor papers, they have different textures. And this seems to be a pretty um, bumpy paper, but not necessarily, I would not call it uh, rough or... Um, extraordinarily bumpy <laughs> for cold press paper, uh, but it doesn't seem to have any kind of grain to it up or down. If anything, it looks like it might have a little bit of a grain that's diagonal. And a lot of that just depends on the process that they go through to make it. But, um, but I did want to show you the texture of the paper and the color of the paper, which is coming off pretty accurate on the camera. It's not like super, super bright white, um, cause I think this is actually natural, yeah, natural white. Um, so as you can see, it's a little bit darker than this, which I would consider a bright, to be a bright white. This is just the cover. Um, and then this is a natural white. I tend to like natural white or bright white for my watercolors, just because if it's, if it's any more, um, toned than that, or, or, you know, if it, if it, um, 
if it veers towards more cream colored, it's it, I, I don't like having that there. I kind of want a neutral canvas to work from. And by canvas, I mean paper. <laughs> um, just so that, you know, it doesn't interfere. Because I could paint anything on that. I, I feel like the, the darker, more colored the paper is, the more it kind of dictates what I may paint on it. So that's the paper, which I'm putting aside. And I'm going to show you this paintbrush as well, although I am not going to be swatching with it or um, giving you an, an example of its use today, but I did want to show it to you. This is the 2 slash 1 Tintoretto or Tintoretto uh, brush from Italy. And I believe that this is vegan as well because it is 100% synthetic. And uh, it's sort of a dagger brush, but has this really nice point on it. Uh, and I wanted to get this mostly for abstracts. Um, I don't know if this would be all that great for landscapes, which is kind of the other main um, genre of painting I do. Although given its shape, it might actually be nice to get sort of um, loose texture on water or maybe skies, something like that. But I'll have to play around with it and let you know. But this is, um, I think it's a new brand that... Uh, Jackson's is carrying and they come in a variety of sizes. I just this size in particular appealed to me because it seemed to be um, Not too big and not too small for this type of brush they, they have some other regular shaped brushes as well, but this is sort of a unique a unique shape there All right, so I'm gonna put that aside as well so um, and then I'll show you these and then I'll get into the swatching so I got a tube of Mars Brown Schmincke watercolor. This one, um, for some reason I thought I had it and it's actually in, <clears throat> it's used as a mixing color in a lot of the um, granulating colors that have come out recently from Schmincke. And uh, since I didn't have it, I kind of wanted to add it to my collection so that I could try and also make some granulating mixes. Um, so I'm going to swatch this and the rest of these three which I'll talk about in just a second on actual little swatch cards because I found that I had I had four left that I had completed and gotten ready and I figured that would be perfect for these but I'm not going to be swatching the um, pans on this I'm going to do that on separate paper so let's go ahead and talk about the other ones that I have in tubes here so these three are Rembrandt brand and because I like the dusk pink so much so, so much. Uh, I decided to try the Dusk Yellow, which um, based on the swatches that I've seen so far, look it actually looks fairly green. Um, so I'm gonna swatch that today. And then I got uh, Quinacridone Orange, which I'm really leaning towards more oranges for my mixes. And this seemed like a really nice orange to, uh, to do that with. And I'm also leaning towards a green gold. So I got, um, azomethene green gold which I had never heard of that color before so I figured that would be kind of nice to try out now on Jackson's the Rembrandt brand comes in um, 10 milliliter tubes and then also pans if you do manage to find them in the United States from a from a US seller um, and, and also I should say I'm in the US so so basically whenever I'm talking about availability I'm talking about it from my point of view in the US you can find some stores in the US like uh, Jerry's Artorama for example they do carry Rembrandt but they carry it in the larger I think it's 15 mil tubes um, but it is much more expensive even accounting for size but in Europe I would think that these would be much more readily available in bigger and larger small <laughs> bigger and smaller sizes um, and uh, probably less expensive just because you know that's that's where it comes from is Europe so <laughs> um, here it's a little bit harder to get okay so I'm going to go ahead and um, let's see I think I'm gonna swatch these first and then I am going to open up this Schmincke palette and show you the, the design of the palette and swatch all of those because I think these are gonna take a little less time. Now, I don't have the swatch cards labeled yet. Um, I probably should have done that before the video, but I kind of um, overlooked it. But I will, so I will not label them today just because that'll be a little too time consuming. 
but I am going to go ahead and uh, swatch them on these cards so that you can see that. So I have some water off to the side here and I am using my um, Rhapsody Sable Brush from Jerry's Artorama to do these swatches. I used to do all synthetic for my swatches, but I found that I actually get better um, water retention in the sable and it doesn't seem they seem to hold up pretty well to this kind of thing the swatching so I, I'm not too worried about ruining them plus this is this is my least expensive Kalinsky brush I got this way way on sale so it, it was not a, a huge investment to be doing this kind of thing so I do also have some half pans here just in case we get some leakage and I need to put these in a half pan when I open them uh, so let's go ahead and start with this Schmincke Mars Brown. Oh, yep. Yeah, I was going to say, just based on the feel, I can kind of tell when a um, pan is ready to sort of push the top off. You can feel it. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in here. And let's go ahead and swatch that. Now, my... Um, my preferred method of doing this, I am going to put the name. I'm not going to put the rest of the information. Um, my preferred method of doing this is letting the tube colors dry in the pan before I swatch them. But just because, you know, I'm, I'm doing this the way I am, I'm going to leave it wet. Um, so this is Mars Brown. And I'll fill in the rest of the information. And this is... Schmincke brand and then uh, like I said I'll fill in the rest of the information later sometimes I do have to go back to the website to get some of this information because it's not all necessarily on the tube itself okay so I'm gonna put those off to the side and I will put this up to the camera when I am done and then also uh, at the end I will put them up to the camera again hopefully I will remember just so that you can see what they look like when they are dry. Now, just based on putting this down right away, I would best bet that this is at the very least a semi-opaque color, um, just because it does seem to have a pretty dark mass tone. And let's see. I don't know if you can hear that, but my computer is going a little nuts down there. That'll just have to wait. Okay. So, and as per usual, I rinse off the brush about halfway, come back with some water, and then for the last little bit, I rinse the brush completely out and just go in with water. Um, I try not to keep it too sopping wet, just so that um, it doesn't dilute the color too much. So as you can already see, there's some granulation building in here, but I'm gonna put that up to the camera and show you before I move on to the next one. So this is the Mars Brown by Schmincke. And I'm also going to compare that Mars Brown at the end to a variety of other browns in the Schmincke line, because I do, for some reason I realize I, I actually do have quite a few browns. So um, I'm gonna compare those at the end once that is dry as well. So stay tuned. <laughs> okay, and then this is the Dusk Yellow. Oh yeah, whoa, that one really tried to leap out. Maybe I should just put all of these in a half pan. Okay. There we go. And let me just label this with the name. This is, oops, uh-oh, I got a little bit of watercolor on my hand. And because of that, I got a little on the paper. I'm just going to dab that really quickly with a wet paper towel. And usually that, if you get to it early enough, you can generally wipe most colors, unless they're super staining, off with um, a wet paper towel. Okay, so this, what did I say, is Dusk Yellow. And this is Rembrandt, which here I am just abbreviating with R-E-M. Okay, and I still have it on my hand, because I got even more there. Oh my goodness, I didn't realize. Okay. 
make sure. Okay, I think I wiped it all off this time. I hope I did. So let's go ahead and go in here. And this one is is much more um, liquid in texture than the Schmincke Brown was. So we'll see. And again, I'm guessing that this one is um, fairly like semi opaque because it again it has a very dark mass tone. Let's see. And like I was saying, it, it definitely looks a little more green. I think I added too much water here, but we can try and correct for that by adding some more pigment. One um, problem is if you add a lot of water and then you add a lot of pigment, sometimes it will um, end up looking a little shiny because the more pigment you add, the more filler in the watercolor that you're also adding. And uh, the more you do that, the more um, shiny your water could become depending on what the um, what the additives are in that particular watercolor okay so this is a really beautiful color it doesn't seem to flow a lot because um, like when I just added a little bit of water there it didn't automatically jump into the water which sometimes colors do okay so I think that's actually really really pretty it's very deep so I would think that this would, one of the reasons why I wanted to try this one is I thought it would be really good for landscapes just because it does have such a nice deep dark tone and um, the fact that it's granulating is, you know, because I love granulating colors. Um, and I'll label those pans later just so that you don't have to watch me do that. So I'm going to go ahead and pour all of them into these little things because that just seems to be the way we're going right now. This is the quinacridone orange. Although, of course, of course I say that and then this one um, stays really nice and behaved. But I'm going to go ahead and put it in here anyway. Okay. Murphy's Law, right? <laughs> okay. And then this one is uh, Rembrandt. And it is quinacridone orange. I'm just going to say quin orange. And just really quickly, I'm going to look and see. Okay, yes, yeah, so this is a single pigment. It's PO48. So let's get going with that one. And this one had a lovely shade of orange in the samples. Oh, yes, it's, it's very nice. Um, but yeah, I've been gravitating more towards oranges for mixing, which originally I thought, oh, well, I don't need any oranges because, you know, I can make orange with yellow and red. I don't, I really don't need to have that in my, um, palettes, but, um, first off, it's sort of a convenience to have orange on your, uh, palette so that you can, you know, colors that you would make by mixing orange, you don't have to, you don't have to mix the orange first. But also, um, I found that you actually get quite a few different mixes with a decent orange. So, um, again, I added too much water here, but we'll go with it. Basically, I didn't, um, I didn't dab off the water off of my brush enough. So let's go in here with this last one. Less water if we can. Now see how that flowed into the water there? Um, so that one flows a lot more. So like I said, this is the Quinacridone Orange by Rembrandt. And I am going to be showing these again at the end and doing that comparison to those browns for Mars Brown. Okay, last one that we're doing this way is this um, Azomethene Green Yellow. And of course, of course, the last two are well behaved. Go figure. Um, there we go. And I'll try to hurry it a little bit up with the uh, Schmincke ones that I'm doing just so that um, so that it doesn't take forever because I do need to unwrap those, which does take a little bit of time. So I'm going to hurry up here. Let's see. So I would guess that this is transparent just because the mass tone is not super uh, strong. 
And then let's go ahead and add down here. Oh, don't want to add too much pigment. Because like I was saying, if you add too much pigment, it can make the sample look kind of glossy. Okay, that's actually a very lovely color. Very reminiscent of green gold. Um, but like I said, I had never heard of this formulation. And uh, wow, diluted out, that actually is really bright and glowy. There you go, lovely. Okay, so I'm gonna label this one just real quick. that off to the side and then we'll take a look at what those look like dried here in a minute. So with this one, I am going to slide off this cover. And as you'll see, it's a very slim package. And this I thought would be a very nice uh, palette that would hold a lot of colors, but is slim as the <laughs> name suggests. And it uh, they always come with this little um, swatch sheet, but I'm not gonna do it on this because I may end up shuffling these around. And uh, when I looked at the composition of this palette, it looked like a fairly normal uh, color palette, but I did want to swatch them because I know that um, you all like swatches and every time I have not swatched things that I did in an unboxing, <laughs> I, I seriously hear about it. So even though this is going to make this kind of a long video, I'm going to go ahead and do that, but I'm going to try and unwrap these and go fairly quickly. So as you'll see, there's no place for a brush in between these, um, these types of palettes often have an area in the middle for a brush. Um, the, this one does not, and it only has one flat mixing area up here. That's generally not a problem for me because I, I, I'm able to keep my mixes separate in that mixing area. Um, the only time that that would not necessarily be true would be if, um, and I'll go through these colors as I swatch them so you'll know what they are, uh, is if I have a really wet uh, wash because sometimes that will get everywhere because you have a lot of water, obviously. And like I said, I'm trying to hurry this up a little bit so that I can get to the swatching. I'm gonna be doing that on some Pentallic paper in my Pentallic notebook that I have off to the side. So I'm gonna bring that in in just a minute. And like I said, I will go through what these colors are as I swatch them. And I'm probably gonna go in reverse order just because um, that's the order in which I will be picking up these um, labels. And I'm not gonna label the swatches, so you'll just have to listen for what each color is as I swatch them. And I'm really only seeing a color or two that I don't know of. Um, or that I have not swatched before. Uh, I, I don't mind getting extras of Schmincke watercolors because I use them all the time and they pretty much last forever in the pan. I mean, it's very rare that you're going to have a watercolor that's going to go bad. I mean, it would take many, many years for that to happen. If you, if you live in a very damp environment maybe, um, or if you handle them with dirty fingers a lot, um, but they're gonna last a long time and I do use Schmincke watercolors quite often. Uh, Schmincke and Daniel Smith are the two brands that I use the most, although I am um, really loving all the Rembrandt colors that I've been using. Um, but they just don't have the breadth of color selection that Schmincke and Daniel Smith have. So it's... Um, even though I like it, it's never gonna take over my collection. And uh, let's see. 
Oh, and I can tell you how I discovered Rembrandt. So, um, so I've been ordering off of uh, Jackson's for quite a while, and um, I ordered a uh, really inexpensive set when it was on sale, sort of the basic Rembrandt set. And when I tested them out, I thought, "Wow, these are way too bright." Sort of like I what like how I felt about um, Sennelier colors. But the more I have used them, the more I have really learned to appreciate them and love them. Okay, so those are those colors unwrapped. Uh, let's see. Maybe I should zoom in just a little bit so that you can see better these swatches. Okay, so I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna go in reverse order so that I can read the labels here. So this is ivory black. And the reason why I'm swatching these is really just to, first off, I'm gonna hear about it if I don't, but, <laughs> but the other reason is just so that you can see what the color combination is in this set if you are able to get a hold of it. So this is actually one of the colors that I haven't uh, worked with and that is transparent umber and it's very beautiful. I um, I really love neutral tones like that um, both on their own and uh, in mixes and that's a really beautiful one. And this is transparent sienna so sort of the uh, the mate to this other one and I haven't really used that one either and the transparent ochre which is the next one is also a new one to me. So there's actually already three colors that are um, fairly new. And this is definitely very transparent and quite light, this um, transparent ochre. And like with the other swatches, I will show you these close up when I am done. And then we are moving on to Helio Green. And Helio, I think, is, is essentially their word for thalo green. Um, <clears throat> and that bears out in the color. It's super bright like although then the next one is thalo green very interesting So I guess they are actually different the helio green and the thalo green. Oh, well, you can tell what the difference is right away um, The uh, thalo green is more like a viridian which it is a synthetic viridian uh, and It's definitely a little bit more blue in tone there from the helio green it's very interesting. I thought they were sort of synonymous. Okay, so the next one is Helio Cerulean, which again, I would think would kind of be synonymous with a uh, phthalo blue. You certainly could use it in place of a phthalo blue. I'm not sure you could use that phthalo green or that helio green in place of a phthalo green because it would be pretty different. Uh, this next one is Ultramarine Finest. They always put Ultramarine Finest in their sets. Um, and I really wish they would reconsider and put um, either a French Ultramarine or, or some other deeper, more granulating Ultramarine. Because this is like the least granulating Ultramarine that they make, I think. Um, and they have like four of them in their, or five maybe even. So I kind of wish they would include some different Ultramarines in their sets. Uh, this is purple magenta, which is interesting. I've used both magenta and um, what's the other one? Mm, Quinn uh, Quinn Rose or or some variant of that from them, um, but they're all very similar. Okay, and this is geranium red, which is a very orange leaning red. And then we have yellow orange, which is kind of an interesting choice here. Because this would, I would, I would definitely um, consider this the warm red and the cool red in this. Uh, and this would be the warm yellow and the cool yellow. They always seem to do a warm and a cool of the primaries in their sets. So this is a set of 12. The case um, can hold 24, and actually I found that these can hold a little bit more than that because there's always, I'm gonna put these off to the side here and I'm gonna, I'll label them off camera. 
um, because I've often found that they leave enough space here to put at least one other half pan. So um, even though it says, you know, it fits 24, you really could put 26 in here because of this extra space. Okay, I'm, um, okay, I'm not gonna mess with that anymore. I just wanted to make sure that I swatched that. I'm gonna show this to you close up. It's actually a very good basic palette. Um, and it has a lot of great uh, utilitarian and useful colors in here. Because you have plenty of earths, you have a couple of greens, which I would consider kind of extras, although phthalo green is pretty useful as a mixing green. Um, and then of course you have the warm and cool of each of the primaries. So that is a really nice collection there. Okay, as I'm getting up to a half hour, I'm gonna really quickly show you this and compare these browns here. So here they are dried. I'm gonna show you up, oops, it's hard to locate where the camera is. <clears throat> That's that green gold. This is that quinacridone orange. Lovely, I'm really loving all of these. Um, this is that Mars brown. And then this is that dusk yellow. And these are all dry now. Um, so I'm gonna put these off to the side. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit and then I'm going to compare. Um, oh, and I did wanna show you just really quickly, here's the dusk pink next to the dusk yellow. They're obviously completely different colors, but they have the same mixing black, the BBK11. I'm not sure of the um, yellow pigment that's in here because I didn't uh, label that beforehand, but this has a yellow instead of a red. So I wanted to show you that one. And then here are all the various browns. So here is Glacier Brown. Actually, I'm gonna move that out and I'm gonna move these. So there's Mars Brown, Glacier Brown. Um, let's actually go with Galaxy Brown, um, Sepia Brown, Matter Brown, Mahogany Brown, and Gold Brown. So as you can see, they're all very different and they would all definitely serve a different purpose. Um, I mix a lot with browns in sort of a place of burnt sienna. I can make a lot of really nice grays with blues with browns very easily, if that makes sense. Um, and this one, this matter brown, really um, leans red. So I could actually use this as in place of an earth red. Uh, this mahogany brown is really granulating and lovely. I would say if... Well, I mean, they're really all super different. So you probably, I mean, you could collect them all, I would think. Um, these two are obviously relatively new to the scene because they are part of that uh, super granulating collection. Uh, this is the Glacier Brown and the Galaxy Brown. I would say of all of these that the Galaxy Brown is probably the closest to the Mars Brown. Um, and I think both of these have Mars Brown in them as a mix. Um, so it's, so it's not really its own thing there. Um, Cause this is this PBR six, I believe. Let me make sure, uh, let's see. Where is the pigment info? PBR six, yes, there it is, it's up here. So PBR six. So these both contain this color. None of these colors overlap with Mars Brown, like they don't have any, they don't have Mars Brown as part of them, or they're actually a single pigment like these two are. Sometimes browns can be fugitive, so you do need to double check the light fastness rating. Um, as you can see, which, which means to me that this one is probably also sort of good instead of excellent, uh, for the ones that consider themselves good, I have, um, you know, crossed off one star. The gold brown is the least light fast. I think it might be fair. Um, I can't remember how it's classified, but uh, it is light, less light fast than all of these. And even, even with a reduced light fastness, as long as you're not in the fugitive territory, um, which none of these are, um, but if, if, if it's called a fugitive pigment, that's probably not gonna retain its color for very long. And um, 
as a finished piece. If you have it in a sketchbook or something, that's probably fine. Um, but if it's going to be in sort of a professional work of art or something you're going to give as a gift or something like that, you probably don't want to be using uh, paints that are fugitive if you're going to be giving someone an original painting. However, uh, it's, it's fine if you're going to be scanning your artwork, for example, and selling prints or, um, you know, giving prints to people. Uh, the fugitive colors are fine. And, and sort of the most popular fugitive color is Opera Rose. Um, and people use that all the time. But if you're going to use that in something that you're... My, my sort of bar is if you're going to give it to someone or if you're going to be um, displaying it as a professional piece of art, whether it's in your house or a gallery or whatever, uh, I would not go with fugitive pigments. But like I said, these are not fugitive. I might give a second thought to the gold brown and using that in something in that context. Uh, but the rest of these, I would be totally fine. And it, you know, it depends on what you're mixing it with and all of that. So there's a lot of different variables. But I did want to show you all those browns next to each other so that you could see them compared. I just realized I had a lot of browns in my collection and I wanted to make sure that you could see that comparison. All right, so now that this video is very long, I am going to say goodbye. Uh, feel free to subscribe to keep track of future videos. I hope to see you there. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, give it a like. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask down below and I'll answer them as soon as I can. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.